So when you ask a question to a large language model, they are really great at generating long sequences of coherent text. And that's why they are large language models after all. They have been trained to learn language, the probability of different permutations of words uh, co-occurring together in a sequence. How can we take a system like that that can output words and then convert it into something that can also output images? Because images cannot be expressed as language, right? So last week, DeepMind introduced their brand new multimodal LLM model and blew everyone's mind. Gemini can input and output text like most other LLMs, but it can also view images, understand it, listen to audio, and most impressively, it can generate images on its own. Okay, now I see blue and pink yarn. How about a pig with blue ears? Or an octopus? Or a bunny with a pink nose? The Gemini paper or technical report doesn't go into much details on what the exact architecture of their network is because it is 2023 and the techniques behind all of the major LLM breakthroughs from these big companies are shrouded in secrecy. I miss the old days when we got every information we needed to learn what the researchers actually did and learn from it. But despite all of that, they did provide some breadcrumbs in their text and references to form an inform judgment about what might be going on behind the scenes with this model. This video is about the algorithms and the ideas behind multimodal LLMs and the purely genius method through which they not only understand but can also generate new images. If you are aware about how LLMs generate text, when you prompt them with something like ask it what color are roses, they basically process the prompt and then generate a reply one token at a time, like roses are red. The generated token at each step goes back into the model and the next token is then outputted until they complete generating the entire sequence. Uh, this method works easily for text because LLMs essentially act as a multi-class classifier at each time step, picking the probability of each word from its vocabulary to occur given the context. But to generate an image, we have to generate pixels. Each pixel carries the red, green and blue value if it's a colored image. So if you're generating a 256 by 256 RGB image pixel by pixel, then the LLM has to generate 196,608 independent values, which is crazy and intractable. Clearly, pixel by pixel is not the way to go here. We need to completely change how we think about images. Since LLMs are good at generating words or subwords of a language like say English, it'll be nice if we could reimagine this whole image generation problem and think about it as another language generation problem. Kind of like Egyptian hieroglyphics or the Mayan glyphs. Ancient languages before the invention of scripture and vocabulary that used images and symbolism to represent words or sounds. But how do we create such a language representation space of all of the billions of images that we have access to in our universe? Clearly, we can't do this manually, so machine learning comes to the rescue here. We need a ML model that can learn to map between images and their coded sequence. This is not an easy task, but deep learning researchers have found a remarkable, almost genius way to still make it happen. And this video is going to cover that. The answer actually lies in a classic computer vision neural network architecture, the variational autoencoder, or more specifically, the vector quantized variational autoencoder, or the VQVAE. Let's get into it. So the autoencoder was developed as a neural network that can compress and extract features from images. So let's say we have an RGB image. It is of shape 256 by 256 and it has three channels because it's an RGB image. So the autoencoder takes an image like this and then passes it through a neural network. This neural network is called the encoder. It can be a CNN based architecture or like a vision transformer as well. Uh, the encoder then compresses this input image into a lower dimensional space, which is also called the latent space. For example, it can be a 32 by 32 by 16 dimensional tensor. You can basically imagine this tensor to be a collection of 32 by 32 vectors where each vector is of size 16. Now, the compression from this original image to this latent space is about 8% because it's just 32 times 32 times 16 by 256 times 256 
times 3 and it's around 8%. But next, another neural network architecture called the decoder inputs this latent space and then outputs a new image of shape 256, 256 times 3, the same shape as the original image. And so the neural network is trained to reconstruct the original image from this latent space. Takes an image, passes it through the encoder to compress it, and then the decoder regenerates the original image and the loss is basically the reconstruction loss between the output image and the original image. And that's what the autoencoder does. There's an old saying in AI that compression is intelligence. By learning to compress millions of images, the autoencoder learns which properties of the image is most important to retain in the latent representation and which properties are high frequency noise that can be omitted. And what's more important is that the autoencoder is a completely self-supervised or unsupervised process. That is, it does not require any manual labeling and all of the features are extracted from the data itself. So let's say that you have an image of a tree. If you pass this tree through your encoder, you're going to get a latent embedding. And let's assume that this embedding is of 100 dimensions. Now, an embedding is basically a representation of your original image. And you can think of it like a point in a high dimension space. Now, if you consider this as your 100 dimension space, this embedding is going to map to a specific point in this space. Now, imagine you had a different image, another image of a different tree. Now, the embedding of this tree is also going to be another 100 dimensional embedding, but it's not going to be the same as the embedding of the original tree. But also, if you map this embedding into your embedding space, you can kind of expect that it's going to map somewhere close to the original tree's embedding because they are both trees. And on the other hand, if you had a car, if you had a car and you you derived its embedding and you mapped it into your latent space, you're probably going to have it somewhere far away from the trees. And this is the effect of compression. The similar images map close together to each other in the latent space and different images are mapped farther apart. It has an effect similar to arranging books in a bookshelf, like how we arrange books that are of a similar genre in the same shelf so that it's easier for us to remember where we kept it. And this also brings us to our next interesting question. So if we know that in this area of the latent space, we can find images of trees, can we randomly sample a new point in this space and then pass it through our decoder to output a new image of a tree? Because if we can do that, we will effectively have created a generative model from an autoencoder because we just randomly generated a point in latent space and use that randomly generated point to convert it into a brand new image. Now this poses a question. If we can convert images into fingerprints using the encoder, can we also use the decoder to convert randomly generated fingerprints into randomly generated new images? Turns out, yes, we can. Techniques like the variational autoencoder do exactly that by turning normal autoencoders into generative image models. Now, without getting into specifics, they train autoencoders so that later on we can generate images by passing in randomly generated latent embeddings. The benefits of the autoencoders does not just stop at compressing, embedding, and generating new images. If you have seen my video on latent space exploration, you might remember that we can also do some other cool stuff like finding similar images from a database or interpolate between two images by slowly adjusting these latent vectors. We can learn about the most dominant trends and biases in our data and even manipulate images like adding a sunglass or making someone smile. Now, we have managed to compress our image by about 92% by representing it with a 32 by 32 by 16 tensor. It is still 16,384 unique values that represent an image. The problem is that the latent embeddings are continuous, meaning each value in the fingerprint can take any real number. This makes it intractable for an LLM because an LLM cannot output these continuous latent embeddings. LLMs are good at outputting a sequence of tokens. So we need to discretize or quantize our latent space and create a new vocabulary from frequently occurring symbols that expresses the contents of the image. And this is where the final evolution of the autoencoder that we're gonna talk here today, the vector quantized variational autoencoder or the VQVAE comes in. 
Now to most, this might be the most technically advanced uh, concept that will be discussed in this video today. So pay attention. The VQ VAE makes two major changes to the autoencoder architecture. One, it separately trains a discrete set of embedding vectors that form the vocabulary of our new image-based language. This list is called the codebook and they consist of a set of learnable discrete embeddings called code words. Let's say we have eight code words, each of dimensions 16. In practice, these numbers are much larger than eight and 16, but it's good for an illustration. Uh, let's imagine this code word embeddings in a vector space as red dots. Now, when the encoder outputs its latent tensor, let's consider the top right vector and map it in our embedding space. It is here. So we find the closest red code word embedding to it. In this case, the third embedding seems to be the closest. So we will replace the entire top right embedding by the integer index three. Maybe for the next vector in our tensor, the nearest codebook embedding is index two. So we replace that with two. We repeat this for all of the feature map to replace each vector with an integer corresponding to the codebook index nearest to it. The resultant 32 by 32 integer map gets inputted into the decoder. The decoder first converts this map back to the 32 by 32 by 16 latent space by fetching the corresponding vectors from the codebook and then proceeds to generate the new image. That's it. That is the entire VQVA forward pass. The main thing VQVA achieves is basically clamp the encoder's output to only contain vectors from the codebook or the image vocabulary. So in a sense, if you can come back to our 2D latent space example, where every codebook embedding has its own positions in the space, as the code words train, they begin to shift inside this uh, latent space, basically optimizing itself to best capture the different semantic information in the input dataset. And that's why it's called vector quantization because each of these uh, code word embeddings control like different portions of the latent space. They are basically quantizing or discretizing the continuous latent space into a bunch of bins which characterized by the code words themselves. You can see this behavior in the Voronoi diagram right here, how the code word embeddings shift during the training to control different territories in the embedding space. They're quite trippy to look at. So intuitively, these code words basically capture different semantic meanings inside the image. And this grid captures how those semantic meanings are spatially arranged in the original image. So in other words, if we can generate random grids and we pass it through the decoder, it should be able to generate new images according to this spatial and semantic code that we inputted to it. And because we still have the encoder decoder architecture, we can convert back and forth between images and their codified representations. We have replaced the continuous fingerprints with a sequence of symbols like we wanted. Now, there are also other works that derive from the VQVA, like the vector quantized GAN that replaces the VA architecture with the GAN or a generative adversarial network to train this codebook. Gemini cites two papers in their network architecture section. Uh, the original DALI paper from OpenAI that did use VQVAE and another one which is Google's own party model which used a VQ GAN. So there's a good chance that Gemini also uses a VQ GAN. Uh, to me, that's a more like an implementation decision and architectural design choice. They are both the means to the same end. So hopefully I've given some intuition about how VQVAs work. Uh, feel free to read up on how VQ GANs work, which are kind of similar. It's just a GAN invariant of the VAE architecture. So now we have arrived at a point where a single image can be represented as a sequence of discrete codes. Deep learning research has taught us if you throw a large amount of data to a huge neural network and then train it for a long enough time, you're going to get good results. And for perspective on how huge these models can be, OpenAI's DALI from 2021 trained 8,192 codebook tokens with a 32 by 32 feature map. And in 2023, that number can easily be doubled by a corporation like Google. A 32 by 32 grid that can contain 8192 categories means at least theoretically the decoder can generate up to, to 2 to the power 9216 unique images. It's just massive. The hard work is now done and now it's time to reap its fruits. And the next part of this video will discuss how we can use the VQVAE to train an LLM to generate images. Uh, let's say we want the neural network to learn the following sequence. A roses are red, then an image of a rose. The text parts of the sequence are pretty simple to encode. They are derived from the LLM's text vocabulary and then embedded using the word embedding and its positional embedding. 
the images however will first go through our vqva encoder to get its coded sequence and these image tokens will then be encoded directly using the codebook embeddings and then its positional encodings will be added to it so now we have a sequence of embeddings and we can train the model using next token prediction the model automatically learns in this unified space that contains both the word embeddings as well as the image or the codebook embeddings and during inference, we can input the model with roses are red and it will start generating the image codes one by one. And once we have the full list of image tokens that we need to generate our 32 by 32 grid that we can input to the decoder, we can generate rose image again. Also note that this method can be easily augmented to support video inputs. For example, the Gemini paper writes that video understanding is accomplished by encoding the video as a sequence of frames. So, so basically just input the video as a sequence of images and each images have their own image tokens and then there's probably a separator to input the next frame. In the Gemini paper, the folks at DeepMind trained on millions, perhaps billions of examples of raw multimodal data acquired from the web. They apply a lot of quality filters to all of the datasets using both heuristic rules and model-based classifiers and perform a lot of safety filtering to remove harmful content they don't want the model to see during training. After pre-training Gemini on next token prediction, they evaluate the models manually and generate new data for instruction tuning with supervised fine-tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback. They write that the data quality is more important than data quantity when it comes to instruction tuning, especially for large language models. Uh, multimodal LLMs and especially those that are able to generate images too is a huge step towards better and more useful AI. If you want to learn more about the history of multimodal models, I have a video that goes over all of the basics, building straight off first principles up to all of the modern LLM based multimodal models that we have today. So feel free to check that one out. In this video, we learn how using the VQVAE, we are able to train a language of discrete image tokens that can be used to train LLMs and generate images in conjunction to text. Our researchers have found a way that works well. And now the main thing between us and good AI is high quality data, high quality supervision, some guard railing, some transparency and honesty from those that develop these LLMs. Thanks for watching. You're magnificent. Don't forget to subscribe because you're going to love the next video. That's cool. I mean, I did it too. Why didn't I finish it?